the title of the Nature News article is Prior Omicron Infection Protects Against BA.4 and BA.5 Variants. And, uh, and indeed, what that entire Nature News article suggests is precisely that, that Omicron, having been infected with Omicron, protects against Omicron, but having been protected, um, having been infected with some, a variant that wasn't Omicron doesn't provide you uh, much protection. But when you actually go to the research, as I did, and I, you know, I did not do the research, I did not spend as much time as I could with these papers, but uh, the original research doesn't say what it says it says, as is too often the case. So let us go to, this is the Altarane paper, there's a couple of papers here. Um, this one, and actually you can show my screen here, and again I'll link to the, the version of this is on the web, but I've got a PDF here. Uh, this is this, the preprint that is primarily being uh, referred to in this Nature News article, uh, and the second author is the primary author on the other preprint. So this is a team out of Qatar, uh, and they have looked at um, at infections and basically health records in Qatar. That's how it's pronounced, right? Mm -hmm. Never never strikes me as right. Uh, which uh, apparently you know is, is a very unusual usual place uh, with something like gosh I forgot now, but. Um, like closing in on 90% of the people aren't from there and only less than 10% of the people are over 50. Uh, so it's, you know, demographically very diverse in one way, but doesn't have very many old people. So the title of this paper, this preprint, uh, which is the basis on which Nature News said, Omicron, previous infection with Omicron provides immunity against future infection with Omicron, um, but previous infection with non-Omicron doesn't do you as much good. The title is Protection of SARS-CoV-2 Natural Infection Against Reinfection with the Omicron BA.4 or BA.5 Subvariants. Okay, I'm going to scroll. Sorry, make you, make you guys dizzy a little bit here. Um, and in there, this is what? This is in this, the abstract. Protection, they say, protection of a previous infection against BA.4, BA.5 reinfection was modest when the previous infection involved a pre-Omicron variant, but strong when the previous infection involved the Omicron BA.1 or BA.2 subvariants. So that seems to be consistent with what you were arguing and what we might expect. Like we, we might expect that if there really are distinct differences between say Omicron and Delta, and the differences between Omicron and Delta are greater than the differences between Omicron BA1 and Omicron BA5, uh, that the natural immunity that uh, an infection would confer would be greater uh, the, the more closely related um, the, the infectious agents were to one another. You would expect that. But what did they do to assess this? And sorry, again, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. This is in the methods. Previous infections were classified as pre-Omicron versus Omicron previous infections based on whether they occurred before or after the Omicron wave that started in Qatar in December 19th, 2021. Uh. Literally, the only thing they did was said, if you were infected before December 19th, it must not have been Omicron. If you were infected after December 19th, it must be Omicron. There are two obvious problems with this. Aside from, no, they didn't actually test for whether or not Omicron was conferring uh, a natural immunity advantage against Omicron. They, they did not do that. One of the issues is, of course, we don't, we don't actually know what people were infected with, although presumably Omicron wasn't circulating in, say, December 2020. Presumably, but do we really know that? Um, more to the point, though, what we actually have here is a timestamp. I mean, quite literally, this is a timestamp. And so what they have found is the totally obvious, but apparently from, you know, if you were listening to the WHO and the CDC for the last couple of years, maybe they didn't quite track this thing that we know from every other immune response ever, which is that the more recently you've been exposed to the pathogen, the more likely you are to maintain natural immunity to that pathogen, right? If so all, all we know, in fact, from this research is the more recent your exposure to COVID, the more likely you are to maintain natural immunity to COVID. Well, I mean, it, I mean, maybe I'm missing something here, but it just seems, especially in light of the fact that the entire reason we're talking about variants is that this thing is evolving in real time. Right. How can you do this and just simply say, after this date, it is X variant? This is exactly the thing that you would need to check in order to know whether or not you were seeing phenomenon A or phenomenon B. Yes, Are you, you would. seeing escape from 
natural immunity or are you seeing incompleteness of natural immunity? They're two distinct things. And there's no way to tell from this research. And what the editorial staff at Nature, again, one of the two premier science journals in the entire world did, was take the abstract at face value. And not, and again, I didn't spend a ton of time with this paper. It didn't take much. And indeed, the Nature News article does have two virologists say, yeah, it's good work, but um, there is this problem. It's like, well, I don't think that qualifies as good work then. So one, one more thing. Yeah. Oh, no, go on. Well, yeah. I just want to point out, there's something, I mean, I think the most important thing here is the way Nature is dealing with the world of preprint prints. Nature, the magazine, not yes. nature, the No, no, not the nature, world. the phenomenon. <laughs> yes. Nature, well, I guess nature, the magazine is it's a phenomenon, a but, yeah. um, but nonetheless, the, we are told that what makes it science is peer review, which is of course, total garbage, right? What makes it science is the freaking method, right? Mm -hmm. That's what makes it science. Peers, to the extent that they can do something, they can evaluate whether or not the method was done correctly and whether or not the things that you believe follow from your evidence actually do follow from it. Mm -hmm. That is not inherent to peer review. Review by peers does it also. But there's something yes. fascinating about this. Nature, so first of all, you probably in the audience will not know unless you're a professional scientist that the people who staff these journals, the top flight journals that make and break careers, mm -hmm. right? These people are people who often did not succeed in science itself, mm -hmm. right? In other words, they have effectively left the rat race of academia and joined the rat race of the journals, which is a different game, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to call them failed academics, but in some ways that's, that's partially what it is. But the point is, okay, these are the stewards of this magical process we call peer review, right? These are the peer of peers. Hmm. Look at what they do with an unpeer reviewed article. First, they grudgingly start looking at this stuff, which they should have. Now, what you and I have said about the preprint literature, mm -hmm. non peer reviewed literature, is that it's very noisy right? Mm -hmm. The quality yep. varies a lot. That's natural because it hasn't been through a filter in which people will catch errors. Yep. That said, it is less distorted by the peer review process. So it's not obvious that more noise is inherently bad if it comes with also more signal because inconvenient truths haven't been excluded, for example, right? Yes. So there is value in that preprint literature precisely because it hasn't been put through our corrupt system. What yes. happens when our corrupt system touches it with the evaluation by peers, in this case, the people who write Nature News, they get it wrong, right? They right. reveal not only there's value in the uh, so-called non-peer reviewed literature, but that when peers touch it, there's nothing magical about their evaluation. They can botch it. They do the same thing scientists do when they're in a rush, which is they, you know, assume that what is reported in the title in the abstract is actually what is uh, suggested by the paper. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the, the whole thing is kind of revealing itself. It is. And um, it's a uh, it's it's a pity you have to know where the bodies are buried in order to see what's being acknowledged and what's being botched, um, because yes. really everybody needs yes. to be uh, exposed to the evidence that peer review is not a magical process. It's a corrupt process and it's a flawed process. Even at a, even when it works, it's a deeply flawed process, and it is so corrupt as to be counterproductive in many contexts. Indeed. So just a couple more things on um, on this here, and Zach, you may show my screen if you'd like, is the other preprint referred to in that Nature News article. Uh, this is uh, this has as the first author, who was the, the guy that was the second author, I think it's a guy, uh, from that other paper. And it is titled, Duration of Immune Protection of SARS-CoV-2 Natural Infection Against Reinfection and Cutter. And this, uh, this I assessed actually less completely than I did the first article. Uh, and so I'm not going to make claims as to, uh, as to how well done this particular research was. It's a lot, uh, it's a lot more sticky with regard to the statistics that they use. But here is a line from, I think it's the discussion. This is just my PDF version of that same article. This waning in natural immunity mirrors that of vaccine immunity, but at a slower rate. Vaccine immunity may last for only a year, 
but natural immunity, assuming Gompert's decay, may last for three years. So this is one of the first times, if not the first time, that I've seen an acknowledgement of natural immunity being superior to vaccine-induced immunity in the scientific literature. Um, there, I believe it has been described, it is very contentious and not widely accepted, but I believe it's been described elsewhere. I'm struggling with whether or not they're conflating two things. Right, their vaccine immunity should be expected to wane because it's crappy immunity. Right, even to the extent that we talk about it in terms of antibodies, they're not the core of a robust yeah. mm -hmm. immune response. They're easily measured, and that's why we focus on them. Mm -hmm. um, they're easily measured, and frankly, to the extent that you want to manipulate the public, the public has some idea what an antibody is, or at least that they're important, and they don't really know what a T cell is. So, mm -hmm. um, so the point is, we've focused on them, but it's it's a feeble kind of immunity. And therefore, you might expect that because the immune system does not depend on this typically for, uh, for immunity to viruses to which you've been exposed, that the short-lived antibody response might wane rapidly. And to the extent that vaccine manufacturers tap into the antibody response as their mechanism for preventing disease, that it would wane rapidly because it doesn't have um, the proper characteristics for long-term durable immunity. Mm -hmm. That's one phenomenon, the failure of the immunity that was generated by the experience. If you got sick, your immunity was more durable than if you got vaccinated. Okay, mm -hmm. But the other thing um, has to do with the evolution of the pathogen. Right. Right. And so the, the you Which, know, you know th this team was tr looked like they were trying to sort that out in the first paper I was talking about. But then when you look at their methods, you find that they actually just used a, a date, you know, a moment right. in time before and after which was their proxy for variants, which is which is not acceptable. It's not evidence. Yes. Yes. It is assumption yeah. is the problem. It, it's, mm -hmm. it, is a, it is an assumption masquerading as evidence. Right. And that's a no no. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Yeah. Um, but so I don't know, I don't know what to do with the fact that you've got these two, you know, to say that the immunity wanes may even be technically true, but is it, you know, you could get that if you had perfectly static levels of antibody immunity and the pathogen evolved away so that they were less and less well tuned, that would cause the observed phenomenon of less and less uh, effectiveness. So is part of what you're going after here is you know, what what does immunity wanes mean? You have um, antibody versus T cell, but let's put that aside for the moment for, uh, for the moment. You also have has your immunity to the thing you were exposed to waned or has the thing you were exposed to become so such a minority representative in the population of this broad lineage of viruses such that while that original immunity that you got from an older lineage uh, may still help a little bit with anything you would be exposed to in modern times, um, it's not that your immune system um, forgot what it knew, it's that it is now being exposed to something that didn't exist before. Not only that, and this I think is where the rubber meets the road okay. for a lot of this. There is a question that haunts our entire COVID response. Would we be better off if we had done nothing, right? Now, that's not the only question. We had other things to do that were not these vaccines right? But had we done nothing, would we be better off today than we are today, given what we did? In which case, you don't want to do the kind of thing we did, right? Now, I don't think we can answer that question. I think uh, I have a strong suspicion. But the basic point is, if you, if your stupid, narrowly targeted vaccine-like substance yeah. <laughs> that you have transfected people with. If that thing is simply pushing around an evolutionary ninja, right? Right. If you have come at like a ninja with plastic cutlery, <laughs> right? And the ninja the is... Pointed stick. <laughs> right. Exactly. If that's what we're doing, right? And the point is, you know, we are training the ninja what we can see by coming at it with a plastic knife that can't possibly work. And right. It's well, just a mistake. And I mean, you actually then arrive us at what was what was going to be my final point here. Um, well, which is, 
How dare they? Why are we in this position at all? Like, we're not, I'm not talking about vaccines at this point. I'm talking about, you know, who gave anyone the right to create this ninja in the first place? Right. Okay. What if we had done nothing in March 2020 when this thing had emerged? How about what if we had done nothing in March 2010? I'm making that number up. I have no idea. When gain of function research was in its early nascent stages, and some people thought it was really great, and were putting together lots of justifications because that's what you need to do. And they started to buy their own press, and they started to create these things, which have escaped from their damn bottles. And there's no putting this genie back in. No, there's they- just there, there's there's the the bottle is gone. The genie is out here. We're all stuck with it. And now they're just adding, you know, injury to injury. Yeah, injury to injury is right. Yeah, there's to the extent that it has become quite clear that this came from the lab, and even in the tiny remaining chance that it did not, that it certainly could have, right? If if this didn't, if this came from the wet market, the fact that there was a laboratory, whatever it is, 14 kilometers away, uh, turbocharging exactly the sort of virus without the ability to prevent a leak means... Is it going to be the ferret badger popsicles again? or <laughs> Yeah, ferret badger popsicles, uh, again, is is right. But to the extent that we did everything necessary to create this insane condition, and probably did create this insane condition, right? This should be uh, a an absolute focus. And yet, we so many of us are aware, but the usual process by which the public becoming aware that something terrible and needless has befallen it, right, would usually trigger a response that we just don't see. 